Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our briefing today, Living with Climate Change, Extreme Heat. I'm Dan Brissett, Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. The Environmental and Energy Study Institute was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics for policymakers. More recently, we've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs to help make energy efficiency, beneficial electrification, and renewable energy more accessible and affordable for their customers. EESI provides informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage of climate change topics in briefings, written materials, and on social media. All of our educational resources, including briefing recordings, fact sheets, issue briefs, articles, newsletters, and podcasts, are always available for free online at www.eesi.org. If you'd like to make sure you always receive our latest educational resources, just take a moment to subscribe to our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Today is the last regular installment of our briefing series, Living with Climate Change. In addition to extreme heat, we've also covered the polar vortex, sea level rise, and wildfires. We're cooking up a little something by way of a bonus installment, which will take place during the week of July 11th, and discuss approaches to integrating equity into emergency management. Subscribe to Climate Change Solutions or follow us on social media at EESI online to stay in the loop for that. And we'll share with you the specific date and time and how to RSVP as soon as we can. We're also approaching the end of our companion briefing series, Scaling Up Innovation to Drive Down Emissions. In that series, we've learned about green hydrogen, direct air capture, electric vehicle charging infrastructure, and are looking forward to offshore wind energy this coming Wednesday. To review presentation materials and summary notes, and RSVP for offshore wind energy next week, check out our resources at www.esi.org forward slash briefings. And just a hint, we're cooking up a, bo a bonus briefing in this series too. When we planned these briefings, we figured it made sense to start with the polar vortex in April and end with extreme heat in June because the topics matched up with the seasons. And as it turned out, our briefing today is unfortunately extremely timely because extreme heat is everywhere in the news. It is really, really hot in the South, in Texas, in Alaska, in the Northwest, and for longer stretches of days, which makes it so much harder to cope with. Extreme heat already causes more deaths than any other type of weather event. So the fact that our days and nights are getting hotter and hotter for longer and longer requires new resources and policies. We need to ensure that homes and commercial buildings, for example, are more resilient to extreme heat. Cooling equipment has to become more energy efficient to help mitigate extra stress and strain on the electric grid on those very hot days, which is already when it tends to struggle the most. And we have to take care to address the welfare and health of those whose work puts them at extra risk of extreme heat exposure. If you want to learn even more about human health and heat, visit www.esi.org to read our latest question and answer article with Paul Schramm, an expert at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And shout out to Jonathan Hers, a fellow on our staff who helped us with that article. But before we get to our panelists, let me remind everyone that we will have a little time for questions, actually a lot of time for questions today, and we'll do our best to incorporate questions from the audience. If you have a question, you can send it to us one of two ways. You can send us an email, and the email address to use is ask at eesi.org, that's A-S-K at eesi.org, or even better, follow us on Twitter at eesi online and send it to us by responding to the live tweeting. Uh, bonus points if you use the hashtag eesi talk. Before I introduce our panelists, we are joined today by a very special guest. Bonnie Watson Coleman serves, is serving her fourth term in the U.S. House of Representatives, the continuation of a career in public service advocating for the needs of all New Jersey families and equitable treatment of all people. The first Black woman, woman to represent New Jersey in Congress, Representative Watson Coleman is a member of the Appropriations Committee and the Homeland Security Committee, where she serves as chair of the Subcommittee on Transportation and Maritime Security, she also serves as vice chair at large of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Representative Watson Coleman, thank you so much for joining our, our briefing today. Hello, everyone. I'm Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman, and I represent New Jersey's 12th district. I'm honored to have the opportunity to welcome you all to EESI's briefing on the impacts of extreme heat. And I'd like to thank EESI for all the great work you do to educate the public on not just how we can fight the root causes of the climate crisis, but the steps we can take to build more climate resilient communities. As our planet warms, extreme weather events are becoming more unpredictable, more frequent and more dangerous. Last year, 
California saw the single largest wildfire in its history. While on the East Coast, Hurricane Ida devastated communities across my home state and others. People in California heard about Hurricane Ida and people in New Jersey heard about the California wildfires. Hurricanes and wildfires, these are tragic natural disasters and they're treated as such by the media, the government and society as a whole. However, extreme heat doesn't get that type of response and yet studies show that it is actually the deadliest natural disaster. This month, I introduced legislation to finally start treating it that way. The Stay Cool Act is a first of its kind comprehensive package that would invest in heat resilient infrastructure, emergency preparedness and support for our communities at risk. In poor communities and communities of color, extreme heat isn't just a nuisance, it's life threatening. In addition to directing the federal government to treat heat waves with the urgency they demand, the Stay Cool Act would invest in public cooling spaces, urban tree canopies, air conditioning for public housing, and other heat relief measures that vulnerable communities desperately need. While building a safer, more livable future for our children must be a priority, we cannot ignore the current reality of life on a warming planet. In addition to combating the causes of climate change, the government must also address the consequences people are facing right now. With that said, I hope you're all looking forward to an important informative discussion about mitigating the impacts of extreme heat. Thank you for all being here today and thank you again to EESI for organizing this event. Well, thank you, Representative Watson Coleman, for joining us today and sharing your perspective on the issue and uh, congratulations on the successful introduction of your bill. Our first of three panelists is Dr. Ladd Keith. Ladd is an assistant professor in the School of Landscape Architecture and Planning at the University of Arizona. An urban planner by training, he has over a decade of experience planning for climate change with diverse stakeholders in cities across the United States. His current research explores heat planning and governance with funding from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the Department of Transportation. Ladd, welcome to our briefing today. I'm really, really looking forward to your presentation. Great, thank you so much, Dan. So today I'm gonna cover um, planning for urban heat resilience. And this uh, stems from a report uh, published by the American Planning Association that is free thanks to a grant from NOAA. Um, and so I'll provide that link at the end of my presentation. Um, and it was written by myself and co-author Sarah Miro at Arizona State University. So I'll just give some highlights from this uh, report. So first of all, of course, um, urban heat and extreme heat are growing risks for the country and for the world as a whole. So we've seen continued rises in average temperatures. Um, the United States uh, has warmed about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, which doesn't sound like a lot, but I'll explain why that's important in a minute. And we're projected to go up to 12 degrees if we don't um, rain in greenhouse gas emissions. And based on that, we've seen increases in the intensity, duration, frequency, and seasonality of extreme heat events like heat waves. And so as you can see in the figure here, just that small increase in that average annual temperature is really pushing us into more hot weather and more record hot weather that we've never experienced before. And that's due to both climate change, of course, and then the urban heat island effect. So how we plan and design cities and then the waste heat that's uh, emitted from things like vehicles and air conditioning. There's many different impacts from heat. Of course, um, the public health impacts are the most widely noted and that's uh, important. And um, of course, uh, heat is the number one weather related killer in the United States, um, but it also affects um, quality of life. And so not just the deaths we need to look at, but also hospitalizations, untreated illness, and just the general quality of life of our community members. Heat affects economic productivity. It affects our labor. Um, it also has environmental impact. So our energy and water usage goes up. And it also impacts landscapes and ecology, both within cities. And then, of course, um, you know, stress is forced. And that's why we've seen an increase in those forest fires, particularly in the Western United States. Heat also has uh, major impacts on infrastructure. And although they're not as visible sometimes as uh, events like hurricanes or floods, 
um, or wildfires even, um, it does have substantial impacts on built infrastructure. And actually earlier this week, one of San Francisco's BART rails derailed because the temperatures got too hot. And we saw similar things last year during the Pacific Northwest heat wave where the streetcars in Portland were literally, the wires were melting, roads were buckling. And so there are uh, substantial infrastructure impacts. Um, and then of course, decreases the resilience and reliability of our energy systems too. One major point here is that um, we feel heat a little bit differently all across the country. So of course I'm here in the Southwest. When we have a heat wave, it is dangerous, um, but we also have chronic heat throughout the year that's dangerous to our populations. That's a little bit different than places like the Pacific Northwest, where last year during their heat wave, they had 1,400 people die in the United States and Canada. And if you think of that compared to a hurricane like Hurricane Katrina in 2005 that killed um, 1,800 people, if, if this was a hurricane, we would have called it a mass casualty event. But unfortunately, we perceive heat waves and the resulting impacts from those a little bit differently. One of the reasons for that is that um, heat is a very complex climate risk, so it's invisible largely, um, and so we don't see it as much um, as those other more dramatic events. But then also the question is kind of which heat are you talking about? So, um, so a lot of cities are using urban heat island maps with land surface temperature from the satellites, which is kind of shown in the right hand side of this figure, which shows us the big picture of um, potentially hot spots in our cities um, by that urban heat island effect. But if you're actually a human being in your built environment under a bus stop, um, you're going to feel different than someone that's walking their dog in full sun and very different than an office worker that is in an um, air conditioned building too. So kind of your, your positionality in the built environment um, exposes you to different types of heat and we need to keep that in mind. And the human thermal comfort aspect um, displayed by those orange colors is also a little bit different than what you might see on your um, phone, which is the ambient air temperature or hear from the National Weather Service um, when they say what the high for the day will be. So there's lots of different types of heat. Equity in urban heat is a big topic, and so um, heat is inequitably distributed across our urban areas. Part of that's due to like, uh, the legacy of racist land use practices like redlining, but we also have continued community disinvestment, which leads lower income communities, marginalized communities, um, minority communities to typically have less vegetation, more impervious surfaces, and to be physically hotter. So those populations and those community members are literally exposed to temperatures that can be 10 or 12 degrees hotter than the richer and wider counterparts across the city. We also have a lot of systematic inequities that we need to look at. And so um, just things like housing affordability and quality, um, do you have access to indoor cooling and can you afford to run your air conditioner? Um, disparities between workplace and school environments for thermal comfort, um, transportation patterns and what uh, safe transportation modes you're able to use, access to healthcare. And very importantly, exclusion from decision making, and I would say at all levels of government. So, um, you know, public hearings in cities are notoriously um, exclusive towards lower income and marginalized populations. Um, but of course, that goes up to the state and federal government too. And so, how able are people um, able to participate in their um, democratic processes, and are their voices being heard? So from our book, we present a urban heat resilience planning framework, and we call urban heat resilience. Um, the idea there is the concept is proactively mitigate and manage urban heat across the many systems and sectors that it affects. So we're trying to get communities to think more about those different contributors to heat. So climate change, urban heat island, natural uh, weather patterns, think about those impacts holistically. So social impacts, economic impacts, environmental impacts, and infrastructural impacts. And then think about the two main categories um, that cities and local communities are using to address heat, which is heat mitigation and heat management. So for those two buckets, um, heat mitigation is reducing urban heat um, in the cities and communities that we have based on how we've built them historically. And so the idea here is that we need to mitigate urban heat as much as possible through changing our land uses, improving our urban design to increase shade, um, increasing urban greening in some places um, as uh, is strategically necessary, and reducing waste heat again from car vehicles um, and air conditioning units that may be inefficient. Um, and heat mitigation is largely the purview of um, urban planners, architects, landscape architects, kind of those that have an impact on the physical built environment. We also have heat management, which is responding and preparing to the heat that we cannot uh, get rid of and we can't mitigate, right? And so some of that is for preparing for um, heat waves, of course, but then we need to think more holistically about heat management. It's not just preparing our emergency managers to deal with the heat wave when it happens. It's also about addressing those systematic inequities I mentioned earlier. 
So do we have resilient and affordable energy systems? Can we help people reduce their personal heat exposure throughout their homes, their workplace, and their travel patterns? Can we improve our public health and medical systems to address heat illness when it does occur? And then, of course, um, we do need to prepare for those heat waves as they happen um, for all segments of our population. And so we're really uh, urging everyone to think kind of holistically about all of those strategies. Um, heat management has largely been the purview of just public health and um, emergency managers, and we really need to break down the barriers between these two sets of strategies. Um, for heat mitigation specifically, um, we have many different tools available for communities to reduce heat um, in the built environment. And we've done surveys of communities across the country, have done interviews with policymakers across the country, um, and we've done plan analysis of plans across the country too. And what we found is, um, well, there's this, there's a, an important concept here that I'll, that I'll start with um, called the network of plans. And the idea here is that it's not just one single plan in a community that determines the future of the built environment, it's all of the plans and policies put together that really shape the future of the built environment and the urban heat island effect. Um, and what we've found through our research is communities are largely, when they do address heat, which is still not often um, across the country, unfortunately, but when communities are beginning to address heat, they largely think of it as a climate action plan um, kind of thing, which you can see there. Um, and they also think of things like urban forestry, which is in our parks, open space and connections, public investment category. And the important concept here is that to address heat in the built environment, we need to uh, include it in community visioning and engagement across all plans and policies, not just climate action plans. We need to regulate the future built environment and future projects that come up from developers um, and think about heat similarly to how we think of flood or fl a wildfire risk. And we need to think of all of our public investments, um, not just parks or urban forestry, but also transportation and transit infrastructure in our public buildings as well. So I'll end uh, my talk just kind of uh, bridging this back out a little bit larger to the federal government. Um, and so this is coming from a piece in Nature that we published with my co-authors um, last fall. And we're really calling for more heat governance to help advance that concept of urban heat resilience. And so here we define heat governance as the actor strategies, processes, and institutions that guide decision making, getting and managing heat as a hazard. And the idea here is that We've managed floodplain risk for over 100 years. We've managed drought risk um, since the uh, Dust Bowl. Um, we've managed wildfire risk poorly, many would say, but we've managed it for over 100 years too, and we've been improving that. Heat risk is really a new climate risk that we have not um, it's set up our governance structures to even, um, even deal with at all. And so kind of one example I'd like to give is that in the last year, we've had the first three dedicated heat officials in Miami-Dade County, the city of Phoenix, and just last week in the city of Los Angeles. So I'll hold up my hands here. Three dedicated local officials for um, heat governance, but that's compared with tens of thousands of floodplain managers in every county and community across the United States. So again, three dedicated professionals working on local heat governance. Um, but we have 19,000 very diverse communities, um, you know, towns, cities of all sizes and of all geographies in the country. So we need to um, come up with governance structures that work for all of those communities to be able to address heat as a hazard. So again, just to kind of recap, um, we really need to advance heat equity with everything that we do. Um, and the White House's Justice 40 initiative is a great example of how that can be done holistically kind of across the federal government. Um, but we also need to address those systematic inequities and again um, participation in democracy making sure that everyone has a, a voice in their local decision making is really important for that we need to both mitigate and manage heat like i discussed but to do that we need to break down those barriers between urban planning and public health and emergency management and that's going to take some work because those groups have not those uh, groups and departments and disciplines have not traditionally worked together in the way that they will be required to work together locally at the state level and nationally to address heat hazard. And we've seen some great examples, um, you know, and we can discuss that during the questions and answers, but we've seen some great examples of communities beginning to bridge those um, divides between those disciplines. We need to think through the metrics that we will measure success for addressing heat on. And um, an example of that would be, do we want to reduce land surface temperatures and give all communities access to um, urban heat island maps, which many of them uh, don't have access to them currently? Um, is that going to be the metric that we look at? Do we want to decrease heat deaths and maybe set a goal for net zero heat deaths because all heat deaths are preventable? Um, do we want to reduce heat illnesses and hospitalizations? 
you can imagine like the the number of different metrics that apply to different disciplines and so unfortunately some of those can be difficult to measure um, and not all communities have the access to resources to measure those properly just to wrap up really quickly we need to coordinate all of these initiatives um, within local governments um, across government scales from local state and federal government and of course between the federal government's various agencies and finally, we need to build heat institutions because, again, these um, institutions and actors and processes just aren't in place. So I'll reference the United States NIHIS program, which is the National Heat Health Information System, um, which is an uh, interagency group um, led by NOAA, CDC, EPA, and others um, that's helping to begin um, coordinate some of those initiatives and address heat, um, but currently does not have enough resources to really, uh, again, serve those 19,000 communities across the whole country. But every agency has a role, and I'd be happy to discuss some of those and the questions and answers too. So again, um, thank you for the time for this presentation. I'm looking forward to hear the other panelists talk um, and uh, this slide, and I believe all of the presenter slides will be available on the EESI website. Um, but both of these resources, Planning for Urban Heat Resilience, again, is free thanks to a NOAA grant, and the Nature Piece on Heat Governance is also free and available for everyone to um, read. Thank you. Thank you, Lad. That was a, a great presentation. And yes, indeed, uh, those resources are available um, if you visit our website, www.esi.org. Um, also posted our Lad slides, which were great, super informative. If anyone would like to go back and revisit those slides, um, his slides and the slides of our other panelists will be posted. And one last reminder is if you have questions, if you were listening to Lad's presentation and you got an idea for a question, you can send us an email, email address to use is ask at esi.org, or you can follow us online on Twitter at EESI Online. Uh, our second panelist today is Sonal Jessel. Sonal is the Director of Policy at WE Act for Environmental Justice. She is responsible for advancing the organization's policy agenda at the state, local, and national levels, in addition to leading its New York City policy initiatives and the Northern Manhattan Climate Action Plan. Sonal, it's great to see you today. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Dan. I'm um, just going to pull up my slides. Hi, everyone. So as Dan said, I'm Solon Jessel, Director of Policy at We Act for Environmental Justice. Today I'm talking about um, why extreme heat is a major environmental justice issue and some active steps we are taking and anyone can take to address it. Um, before I begin, WE Act is a community-based organization based in West Harlem. We are a membership-based organization. We have about um, 800 active members at a time, um, all mostly, but it's open to anyone. Um, we do focus on Harlem, Washington Heights, and Inwood um, neighborhoods. These are neighborhoods that are predominantly people of color and low income, and we've been organizing these communities against environmental racism since 1988. So uh, we got a great start, so I'll go through some of these couple slides quickly. Um, heat waves in general are increasing in severity, frequency, and duration, and um, we have to respond quite uh, swiftly to this growing threat. Um, in New York City, Columbia University projected that there'd be um, by uh, there'd be over um, 3,000 heat deaths by 2080 if we do not do anything, if we keep to the status quo. Um, 3,000 heat deaths annually, apologies. So one reason why we're really worried about extreme heat in a place like New York City is because we have the urban heat island effect um, in which we do see higher cooling because, I mean, higher, more heat because buildings, um, tr cars uh, all create a lot of heat. There's a lot of concrete where heat gets trapped into, into our streets. And so we see much, much, much higher temperatures in New York City compared to um, the suburb or, or rural areas outside of the city with much more vegetation. So extreme heat is actually the number one weather related killer in the United States. Um, most people think about hurricanes or tornadoes as big killers, and it's true. However, um, heat is sort of what people consider the silent killer because it does fly under the radar. A lot of times heat deaths um, don't get recorded as heat deaths, but get recorded as um, strokes, heart attacks, um, other kind of um, causes of mortality on their hospital records. Um, so sometimes it can be really hard to track who's really um, being hospitalized or going to the ER 
or um, dying from extreme heat. However, that is what is found to be the told the whole truth. However, um, this is a quote I don't actually know who it's attributed to, but I think people have heard this many times before. We are in the same storm, but not in the same boat. So not everyone is impacted by heat equally and not everybody experiences heat at the same um, temperatures. And so the reason why we act for environmental justice works on this issue is because we do consider it a major environmental justice issue in which people, um, vulner certain vulnerable populations are disproportionately burdened and impacted by extreme heat. So these are the kind of traditional people that we talk about that are impacted by extreme heat the worst, older adults, children, people with chronic illness like respiratory illnesses, people who are pregnant, people who are working outdoors for long hours. Um, these are all the populations we really traditionally talk about. However, we act, we look at populations um, that are actually attributed to having more heat illness and death and impacts due to a lot of structural reasons, structural and institutional racism over the years that has led um, other populations to also be vulnerable to extreme heat. So in New York City, we have a lot of older, poorly maintained apartment buildings. This is true in cities across the United States um, where buildings do not cool down at night. They do not cool efficiently, even if you, with an air conditioner or a fan. Um, and they are poorly ventilated and so you have people living in spaces that are um that do accentuate the impacts of heat um people also live in really crowded apartments something that is found in research is that um, in low-income communities where you can't afford to run or own multiple air conditioning units. You might all spend time in one room together intergenerationally, and that can have some impacts such as um, children needing to concentrate to do their homework, but they can't when um, they're in a crowded space, for example. So there are a lot of reverberated impacts uh, due to extreme heat. Also neighborhoods that have less green space, more air pollution, industrial sites, buildings, um, all of that comes from uh, environmental racism in which communities of color and low income have been disproportionately um, burdened with highways and industrial sites and uh, truck traffic and all of these different sources of air pollution and sources of heat. And um, they are also places that did not and still do not receive enough investment in green spaces in trees in um, <clears throat> infrastructure that lowers temperatures or helps people um, adapt to the heat on a daily basis. And a lot of that has been connected to the um, racist legacy of redlining in which across the United States, in which many, many, many parts of uh, cities across the United States were considered not worthy of investment from the government or for um, housing investment. And what we got was uh, no parks in places like Harlem in New York City. And um, then it's also people that are already stretching their resilience, people who are dealing with housing insecurity, food insecurity, um, rent uh, burdens, chronic illness, concerns around their immigration status, so many more issues that are really affecting people to this day that frankly does take um, a lot of people's ability to be resilient. It takes up, a, it creates a lot of psychosocial stress. And what it does is it makes it difficult for people to respond to protecting themselves against extreme heat when they're concerned about responding to making sure they have the medications that they need, for example. So um, when we talk about extreme heat, it's very much a risk multiplier. In the United States, we've dealt with environmental racism for a long time, but climate change, as it gets much worse, it's really accentuating issues that already exist. Um, environmental racism, which I've used the term a couple of times, but really is the idea that there is discrimination in the ways that people benefit or are harmed by in the environment um, when it comes to policy, when it comes to interpersonal relationships, or when it comes to big um, systemic um, policies. This all leads to environmental health impacts. And because of climate change, and therefore we're seeing a rise in extreme heat, um, heat is not only an issue individually for itself, but it it risk it accents existing problems um, that are people are already dealing with. So um, for example, when we're talking about 
um, rental insecurity, people trying to afford their rent in an increasingly expensive world, um, uh, the extreme heat just makes that matter worse where they might not be able to afford paying their utility bills to cool their home down if they're worried about paying for their rent and not getting evicted from their homes. So um, we act has been working in extreme heat for a couple of years now, and we particularly launched a heat health and equity initiative where we have been talked to members of the northern Manhattan public about uh, what they're dealing with when it comes to extreme heat. And the thing that came up the most when we asked these open ended questions about heat was that they are most concerned around getting adequate cooling both in their homes and um, in their sort of daily lives so outside of their homes as well and that is the biggest issue that people are grappling with and we know that access to cooling is also the number one preventer of of heat illness and death as well so that is what we focus on as an organization when it comes to extreme heat um, ultimately what we came to after speaking with our members uh, of northern manhattan was that uh, there is a strong desire for a holistically healthy and cool home, and that is something that disproportionately communities of low income and color have not been given in the United States, um, and particularly in our conversation about uh, New York City that has been true. Uh, landlords that are not properly maintaining homes, uh, the lack of access to air conditioning, fans, or just an energy efficient home very high and currently increasing utility bills um, chronic illness from for children or elderly people uh, poorly ventilated home that exposes you to uh, air pollution such as um, knocks from your gas stove and um, homes that do not cool down during the day all of these are different ways that extreme that a home has been made unhealthy um, as related to extreme heat so when we spoke to our members, we did hear a lot about what they thought um, the issues were, and this is sort of a little graphic of a lot of the different things that people said. They said um, that um, you shouldn't have to travel 19 blocks to get cool, for example. So when trying to access a cool place to go, there should be more immediate access for people. So cooling centers that are close by or a home that's cool. Um, people feel that their legislators, their decision makers do not understand the issue and do not care. Uh, there have been a lot of statements of uh, around the fact that the legislators do not understand um, what people are dealing with on a daily basis and are not making decisions based off of um, supporting the needs of people um, on the vulnerable populations. People also feel that most um, decisions that are made are going after short term fixes instead of long term um, interventions that will fix the problem, um, both mitigate and adapt to extreme heat. For example, providing someone with an AC is not the same thing as creating an energy efficient home that is actually fully healthy. Um, uh, put subsidizing a utility bill is not the same as having a lower utility bill, things like that. Um, people also feel that their utility providers do not um, care about their health and well being as well. And many people talked about how they trade off um, their needs. So someone was talking about how they um, prioritize their health needs over their pooling needs, or they prioritize their children getting cooling, over them getting cooling, um, lots of things like that. So in response to this work with our membership and our growing research that we do at WEACT, we have created a policy agenda. We did this first in 2020, and now we have one in 2022, where we essentially are um, have outlined and, and we well, it is um, one of the provided links for everyone, but this outlines what we are hoping to achieve uh, both as short term responses, which is, um, you know, the idea that providing cooling, subsidizing utility bills, having adaptive measures and parks like having misters and making sure there's people doing community outreach around um, extreme heat safety are all short term emergency response solutions. And those types of things are outlined in our agenda. But what's also outlined in our agenda are long term um, high impact solutions such as electrifying low income housing 
and subsidizing that electri the cost of electrifying low-income housing, switching out fossil fuel energy for renewable energy to lower utility bills, provide a more resilient energy system, and ultimately um, reduce air pollution, for example. We also believe that office buildings that are not in use should not be able to set their temperatures to 60 degrees. Um, we do think there needs to be better communications and better warning systems around extreme heat. One thing we are interested in seeing um, piloted across the United States are um, heat warning systems, um, much like the way that California does for fire warning systems where um, you know there might be a rating. So in New York City, if there's a really hot day, we might get an alert like we're at a heat level five. This is a very, very dangerous day. Um, these are the types of um, uh, policy items that we outline in here that we want to see done that is informed by the membership that we work with. I believe that is it. Um, thank you all. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much. Um, so many great points you brought up. I really like the energy, the 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 side by side house slide. And I might borrow what you said about stretching people's resilience. That's a great way to think about that. So thanks so much for your presentation. And as a reminder to our audience, if you'd like to go back and revisit Sonal's presentation or uh, review her slides, everything's available at www.eesi.org. We're getting some questions from the audience. So um, thanks for that. Um, you can send us um, questions via email, ask at eesi.org or follow us on Twitter at ESI Online. Our third panelist today is Dr. Juan Declet Barreto. He is the Senior Sci Social Scientist for Climate Vulnerability at the Union of Concerned Scientists. At Union of Concerned Scientists, Juan researches maps, uh, researches, maps, analyzes, and finds solutions to the unequal human health and livelihood impacts of environmental hazards, particularly those exacerbated by climate change. Juan, it's great to see you today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. Okay. Well, um, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you to ESI for the opportunity uh, to brief congressional staff and the public on existing and projected impacts from extreme heat augmented by climate change. Today, I would like to share with you how we at the Union of Concerned Scientists are thinking and researching extreme heat impacts on the population. I'll focus on two recent, relatively recent reports. Uh, the first one is a focus on the societal choices we have to avoid the worst of climate change augmented extreme heat impacts. And the second one is, a, is a, an, an analysis where we calculated wages lost by outdoor workers due to extreme heat on the various scenarios for carbon emissions reductions. I will finish with a few opportunities to, for federal and local action on climate change, and I hope to contribute to the conversation on how to urgently and equitably act on climate. Just a second, please. All right. As uh, the previous two presenters said, extreme heat already presents serious dangers to our health and livelihoods, and it is currently the top weather-related cause of death in the U.S. And that heat is on the rise as climate change continues unabated. To illustrate how our summers have changed due to climate change, I would like to borrow a passage from a recent op-ed written by my UCS colleague, Eric Spanger Siegfried. Start quote, a new climate reality has emerged. If it's warm, it's dangerous season. Barbecues, beaches, vacations, it's summer. Alongside its pleasures though, summer in a warning world isn't what it used to be. If global warming is our world's underlying disease, May through October in the Northern hemisphere is when its fever spikes and its worst symptoms surface in the form of increasingly frequent and severe climate events, end quote. Calling the summer danger season is a stark reminder of what we are facing. Consider, for example, that summer officially started earlier this week, and this year's hurricane season just started on June 1st. But since at least late May, there have been heat waves in New England, the Southwest and California Central Valley, wildfires in New Mexico, a tropical storm form off the coast of Florida, and who can forget the recent incredible image of images of destructive flooding in Yosemite National Park. So, with that danger season framing in mind, let's talk about what unabated climate change means for extreme heat in the near future. Projections of how heat is likely to change because of global warming typically are done with just temperature, but humidity is a very important part of the story as it affects our experience of heat. So we saw a need for projections of how extreme heat is likely to change in terms that US residents are most familiar with, the heat index, which includes humidity and is what the National Weather Service uses to issue heat advisory alerts. For our killer, uh, for our 2019 killer heat work, 
we developed projections of how heat index values are likely to change across the US using extremely fine resolution climate models. If you imagine a grid being plopped over the US, each box would measure two and a half by two and a half miles wide. We calculated the daily maximum heat index for the 21st century for three future emission scenarios of slow action and no action to reduce emissions and a rapid emissions reduction scenario similar to that contemplated in the Paris Agreement. We looked at the number of days in an average year in which heat index values were above a few different thresholds that are dangerous to various groups of people, 90 Fahrenheit, above 100 Fahrenheit, and above 105. And, and off the charts, um, heat index, where we could not reliably calculate it due to exceedances in both the relative humidity and the, um, the, the maximum daily temperature. What did we find? We found that by mid-century nationwide, if we fail to reduce global heat trapping emissions, the number of days with a heat index above 105 will double, and the number of days above 105 will quadruple. To give you some examples, Austin, Texas has experienced historically on average five days with a heat index of 105 or higher. But by mid-century, with no action on climate change, it could experience 59 days, so nearly two months worth of uh, really dangerous heat conditions. Oklahoma City has experienced four such days, could experience 43 by year on average by mid-century. Raleigh, North Carolina has experienced three or so um, historically and could experience 26 by year by mid-century. We developed data at the congressional district level for 433 congressional districts, and these are available in English and Spanish in the form of fact sheets. Using our district fact sheet map, um, which can, uh, th there's, there will be a link provided, um, users can find where they live on the map, click on the area and see a pop-up window and download the fact sheet for the congressional district. The fact sheet is a front and back overview of our report findings, policy solutions, and each one has a snapshot of the findings for that, for that district. Here we can see an example for Salt Lake City, which shows that um, the that second, Utah second district historically had 11 days on average of temperatures above 90. And if we don't meet the goals of Paris, that is if we don't take rapid action on climate, we'll have more than one month, uh, 42 days or so um, on average above 90. So definitely a high increase in, in extreme, in, in high heat conditions. Now I'll turn over to the impacts on workers. What can these levels of heat mean for the ability of outdoor workers to earn wages? We, follow, we followed up our killer heat foundational work with an analysis we call too hot to work. We estimated outdoor workers' work days and earnings at risk in the future from climate change using the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's recommendations on reducing outdoor work based on temperature and humidity conditions. There are 32 million outdoor workers in the US, from construction workers to farm workers to emergency responders who regularly face the brutal choice, risk their health by enduring dangerous exposure to heat or risk their jobs by staying home. And these dangers are real. Maria Isabel Vasquez Jimenez on the portrait um, that one of her loved ones is holding in the picture on the bottom left of this image is one among many outdoor workers who have died from heat exhaustion due to lack of protections. And uh, like uh, Dr. Uh, Keith, Keith said, these are entirely preventable of deaths. In our report, we also found that between now and mid-century, outdoor workers' exposure to extreme heat would quadruple, risking $55.4 billion in annual earnings nationwide. By mid-century, outdoor workers' exposure to extreme heat would quadruple. This we also found disproportionate impacts on, um, on, uh, on workers of color. The average outdoor worker risks losing more than $1,700 in annual earnings. The workers in the 10 hardest hit counties risk losing nearly $7,000 per year on average. Outdoor workers in construction and extraction occupations are projected to face the highest total earnings at risk at about $14.4 billion annually, followed by those in installation, maintenance, and repair occupations at nearly $10.8 billion annually. And going back to the um, inequitable distribution of these, of, of, of these impacts, we also found that Black, African-American, Hispanic, and Latino people uh, that hold more than 40% of outdoor jobs, despite comprising less than one-third of the overall U.S. population, suggest that these workers will disproportionately bear the brunt of these changes. I'll talk about this in a, in a minute, so I will jump over here. 
So there are uh, a few opportunities for action. There are some um, actions that are happening at the federal and local uh, levels. Uh, the other, uh, my co-presenters discussed some of these. Um, but at the federal level, at the Department of Labor, um, there are, uh, OSHA just um, uh, announced and started the process for developing protections that employers must follow, such as implementing water, rest, shade training, and acclimatization procedures for new or returning employees. Um, there is the uh, Senator uh, Marquis um, Heat Illness and Deaths Act to, uh, um, to, to prevent some of these uh, deaths as well. There's uh, the, uh, also the, um, the State Cool Act that Congresswoman Coleman um, discussed in her intro remarks, um, which is a package of proposals for addressing the increased threat of heat emergencies by improving how we study, react to, and mitigate extreme heat. There's the Asuncion Valdivia bill um, introduced by um, uh, Rep. Grijalva, which seeks similar protections to those in the OSHA National Emphasis Program on Heat Illness. Again, protections like shade, water, training for managers and employees to recognize heat stroke symptoms. And I'm also, and I'm also excited to see that at the local or state level, like it was discussed earlier, um, there, there is some action. Oregon has created worker protections, measures similar to the recent ones mentioned uh, that are being done by OSHA. And a few cities like Miami, Los Angeles, and Phoenix have created offices to respond to immediate heat, like uh, Dr. Ladd mentioned. I will stop there. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, I look forward to the, to the Q&A. Um, I know there, there was a lot of information here, so I'll be more than happy to um, uh, dive in a little bit more. Thank you. Thanks, Juan, and I appreciate you joining us today to share your uh, insights and expertise and perspectives on the issues. Thank you very much. Um, we are going to uh, do our Q&A a little bit differently today, and that is because we are joined by uh, another special guest. Uh, Kurt Schickman is the Director of Extreme Heat Initiatives at the Atlantic Council's Adrian Arst Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center. Previously, Kurt was the Executive Director of the Global Cool Cities Alliance, which he launched in 2011 and built into a global network of over 70 cities implementing passive cooling solutions to combat rising urban heat. He's led projects for the World Bank, the Department of Energy, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, and the Clean Energy Ministerial. He's the lead author of a, a Primer for Cool Cities, Reducing Ex Excessive Urban Heat, a World Bank publication. And of special note, Kurt is the newest member of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute's Board of Directors. So Kurt, welcome to our briefing today. You're going to lead us through the questions and answers. And I think at this time, it probably makes sense for Lad and Sonal and Juan to turn their videos on. Uh, take it away, Kurt. It's great to see you. Great. Thanks very much, Dan. And thanks for the kind introduction. And thank you, Juan, Lad, and Sonal for all your work over the many years on this issue of heat and for these presentations today. I think it's uh, more important than ever that this information gets out to as many people as possible so we can take appropriate action. So thanks again, not just for today, but for all the years of great work that you all have done. Uh, I, I guess I want to start with where Juan ended and also reflect on the points raised by both Sonal and Lad regarding just a broad set of challenges that are now exacerbating uh, uh, that are now exacerbated by rising temperatures and that affect people's ability to survive the heat. And looking at existing federal programs, what existing federal programs are, are out there that can help uh, communities build resilience to heat or which could be modified or enhanced to do that? And I, I'm happy to start with any one of you, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask uh, Sonal to kick us off if that's okay. Sure, yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a number of federal programs. I would say one of the biggest ones we focus on is the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program that's run by HHS. And um, it is a huge pot of funding for assisting people with energy needs. And um, it works differently in different states, as I'm sure a lot of our viewers know. Uh, however, in some states, it doesn't subsidize cooling bills. And that is the biggest gap that we see in New York State. Um, <clears throat> that right now, all that the program does is it provides a value of up to $800 for an AC unit every once every five years. So it's not exactly helping people <laughs> be protected against extreme heat. And um, what we want to see is that funding mechanism uh, upgraded both from the federal side and then in individual states 
to actually react to a change in climate, which hasn't we have not seen really happen at, at enough of a pace in New York State. So that's a big one. Um, and then HUD has a big climate action plan that we think is um, promising in terms of having metrics, uh, goals around energy efficiency uh, in homes, which is really important for extreme heat mitigation. Um, however, we want to see it go farther. Um, we particularly want to see a lot more funding going to low income housing, public housing that really needs that, um, really needs funding to, to be better maintained and um, deal with long history of, of disinvestment or non-investment that, that has led to a moment today where there are more vulnerable from extreme heat. Um, and then lastly, all of the funding from the bipartisan infrastructure bill, um, we are really, really pushing for Build Back Better. We think there's a lot in there that's really important. We really just need um, to better react to climate change, both for that resilience piece um, and for that adaptation piece as well. So, so th those are some of the, the big ones. I, I'd like to add to what Sonal said that um, there's the Weatherization Systems Program, um, which is um, ministered by the Department of Energy. Uh, I'm not exactly sure if there's some interaction there with HUD, as you mentioned, but um, I think the broader, what a broader problem is like that, as, as Sonal said earlier in her presentation, the impacts um, and the structural barriers for people to become resilient against heat are multiple. They don't, that then they're structural, they're social, economic, and racial. And programs, by virtue of the way that federal government works, is focused very narrowly on specific things and assets like housing, like the AC bill, the power bill, um, and, and, and so on. Whereas there is a need for a broader understanding of climate impacts with large. Um, and how existing socioeconomic and racial disparities um, are being exacerbated by climate impacts and are making it more difficult for people to be able to put food on the table and stay safe. Yeah, like I said in my presentation at the end, um, NIFIS is really important because it's an interagency group and kind of provides the cooperation that we want to see for a whole of government approach. Um, so again, NIHIS is really important to continue support, um, but it just doesn't have the resources again right now to support the 19,000 communities across the country. Um, I've been working on heat for what feels like a long time now, um, and every year the interest has been increasing, which has been a good thing. Um, so historically, it's been NOAA, CDC, and EPA have all had really histor strong historic roles um, addressing heat, and I want to applaud the work that they've been doing. Um, EPA has a heat island reduction program, which has been running for longer than anyone else has had heat island related resources for local communities. Um, of course, NOAA with the National Weather Service, those offices are so critical, like Sona was mentioning, providing those early warnings for their local communities. Um, and then CDC has a number of different programs, obviously. Um, BRACE is one of them, Building Resilience Against Climate Effects, um, which is uh, helping connect climate change to public health departments. Um, but I think outside of those historic places where heat has been a uh, focus on, um, every single federal agency needs to integrate thinking about heat. And you can imagine Department of Labor, based on what Juan was talking about, needs to really um, take heat more seriously. Um, Department of Education, you know, we know that heat affects learning outcomes and that many schools are just uh, physically too hot for students to be in and as summers increase. So Department of Education needs to uh, address heat. Um, heat's a national security risk. So it's Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security. So, you know, I could go down the list of every single federal agency, but we need a whole of government approach to really address heat as a national risk. Great, that's fantastic. Such a wide variety of opportunities there to, to, to make a difference in these, these programs and have it do something good for heat. Uh, I, I wanna turn actually, Lad, uh, to something you said in your presentation, and, and we'll, we hear from everybody here, but you, you raised the point about establishing metrics for success for these programs around, around heat resilience and how critical that is. And, and I really couldn't agree more. Uh, and so I wonder, because thinking about the, in so your presentation, Looking at, I'm thinking of that bubble, the, the the different reactions people have to the issue of environmental justice and heat, and just how many different ways we can approach that, and, and wind your presentation as well in, in this space around worker uh, safety. There's so many different metrics we could choose, or or uh, so, uh, you know clouds of metrics we could choose, and so I wonder if you all have some thoughts on 
how communities and cities and states or the federal government could go about making decisions on what to track and evaluate when it comes to, uh, to evaluating success in these, in these programs. And happy to start with anybody who wants to jump in first. Um, I, I, I would say that a good metric to start or a, a good principle to start developing metrics would be to what extent do programs address existing historical and contemporary inequities, right? Um, we have seen uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a world where you have limited resources, you need to have some criteria to prioritize what sort of resources you're going to deploy. It could be social resources, it could be actual capital invest, capital investments projects, uh, um, um, retrofitted buildings, weatherized buildings, vegetation, uh, a beetle reduction, and so on. Um, there needs to be a criteria that should be socially and equitably based. Um, and there's plenty of um, data um, to guide to guide that. That's something that I'm very happy to see. For example, at the local level, the city of Phoenix has announced that they will develop these um, uh, canopy corridors, one mile uh, uh, long corridors uh, of vegetation, which is, is a very adequate measure for a hot gridded city like Phoenix. Uh, the point is that, which may not work everywhere, right? But the point is that um, doing that based on, vulner on population vulnerability to heat criteria based on the multiple studies that have been uh, conducted, including some um, uh, by, by myself and my, my colleagues um, and others, um, to guide the placement of those um, of those of those resources based to, to get the best bang for the buck because equality and equity are not the same thing. If you provide blanket resources, if you blanket the whole city or the whole region with with resources, then you are going to be reproducing the same inequities that already exist because not everybody needs um the same amount the same amount of resources because they can drive a they, some people can drive an air conditioned car to an air conditioned office at work instead of riding a bus or in the back of a pickup truck to go work in a landscaping job for example so an equity an equity uh, social equity principle thanks yeah i would just add one challenge for communities that are trying to address heat risk for maybe the first time which is um, honestly most communities in the united states still at this point um is just there's a lack of information and a lack of resources to uh, obtain that information um, and again this is a new risk that's being considered and so we just don't have a history of collecting the correct information the transparent information um, connected to the goals that we have um, so one one example that's an easy one because people think of heat related deaths with heat is um, that was mentioned by Sonal even I think um, is how do we how do we categorize heat deaths and you know I'm fortunate here in Arizona where it's historically been hot and we have a history of doing a really good job of collecting heat related deaths and illnesses I think probably I would say the best of the country right just because we have that history um, but there's many states that just don't have that same history and so when a death occurs like was mentioned before it's not tagged as a heat related death it's just tagged as heart disease or heart attack or you know pulmonary disease and so I think um you know that's that's something that the federal government can help with again because a lot of those heat deaths are recorded first at the county level it goes up to the state level and and just even getting a better idea of where we're actually at because um we know that heat deaths and heat illnesses are vastly underreported, um, even with the good work that's being done right now. So, so that's one example. You know, urban planners may be more interested in percent of tree canopy cover in their cities. That will not be one goal for every city because I guarantee, um, with the mega drought in the Southwest, um, our urban forestry goals are going to be a little bit different than New York City or Chicago or Portland, right? And so, I think I think a lot of these goals will have to be place specific and developed by the local communities. But the ability to access the information needed to set those goals and to understand how we're doing um, in addressing heat is something that the federal government um, can really help support local communities with. That's great. Thank you both very much. Um, I want to turn to a question around scale, which always means a question around funding and financing. Um, and I think we're seeing a number of innovative ways to open up financing for heat mitigation and resilience. And I'm thinking, for example, you know, uh, LA's Climate Resolve's work on uh, to recognize the economic value of broader greenhouse gas uh, mitigation benefits from cool roofs, for example. And I'm wondering if uh, the three of you are seeing any public, private, or even hybrid opportunities to finance and fund this work at scale? And, and what could be done by policymakers that may be on this call uh, to help accelerate funding and financing in this space? Uh, 
I guess I can start with what I ended my last comment with, which was build back better. <laughs> um, that's definitely, definitely big number one for us. Um, we need funding for long term fixes to this problem. We need emergency funding, yes, but long term is what we need, what we're looking at. Um, we need to equip people with the tools to be able to combat rising heat um, in the in over many, many, many years and protect their health. And we need funding to make sure that we don't have polluted cities and therefore more at risk people for heat. Um, higher asthma means you don't want to walk down the street on a really hot day. Um, we hear that from our members all the time. Uh, so how do we prevent these long term risks that lead to extreme heat deaths? And how do we create long term fixes to extreme heat, which is efficient cooling and renewable energy? Um, and then on in the, the smaller scale, we really need um, federal funding that's coming from bipartisan infrastructure act and you know all the various um, funding sources that have come over the past couple of years to be going to programs like expanding LIHEAP so states can cover utility bills for low-income people in the summertime um, we want to see funding go to the weatherization assistance program more of that to go to WAP as well um, and we want to see both of them really be scaling up things like heat pump installations and low income housing, because that's something that's absolutely unaffordable for people at this point in time. Um, so those are some of the big pools that we are looking at, and we really highly recommend anyone um, in their states to be looking at sources of funding for those kinds of solutions. Yeah, I definitely agree with what Sonal said. Uh, those those two particular programs, you know, Light Heap and and the Weather Weather Station Assistance Program, have been chronically underfunded for a long time. Um, and e even 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 during the emergency funding that was given by Congress uh, during COVID, um, there was there was there were huge there were huge sums of money put into those uh, part to go into those programs, but they were not nearly enough for the need. You know, they were just um, covering the gap that had been widening over the last over the last year over the previous years um so definitely that that to build back better as well and um to try to implement to, to, to make good on the justice 40 commitments that the administration has um there needs to be and, and this is what communities have said also in the context of the white house uh, climate and economic justice screening tool to help guide those investments in their in their beta versions that there need to be mechanisms and clear guidance for communities to be able to um, apply um, for for those funds and obtain those funds in ways that are equitable. Um, without that, then it become, becomes unclear um, how, um, um, how how effective um, these efforts are going to be. Yeah, I mean, so for public investments, um, there are examples of many local communities starting to invest serious money into heat mitigation. Um, often it comes with the co-benefits of like green stormwater infrastructure, urban forestry also reduces flood risk. And so kind of looking for those co-benefits where they can, right? Um, here in Tucson, um, the voters approved a $225 million bond, which very much had heat at the forefront. It was a parks bond. Um, and a green connections bond with the idea of cool corridors and um, increasing urban forestry where it's strategically placed and where we can utilize rainwater resources, right? Um, our city of Tucson Mayor and Council also passed a utility fee that has a low income equity component so that lower income households don't have to pay it, but that also funds more public investment into green stormwater infrastructure as part of the city and the um, Tucson Waters um, one water uh, approach, um, which has the co-benefits again of heat and water resources. Um, and then again, we have those three examples of um, those communities that have uh, appointed chief heat officers or developed in Phoenix that Office of Heat Response and Mitigation. I would caution, though, um, a lot of our focus always goes to like what new money is needed to address this risk. And we're obviously living in a time that there's not a lot of new money floating around and it's really hard to obtain. Right. And so, again, three chief heat officer type positions um, are not going to be appropriate for 19,000 cities in the United States and towns. Um, so we need to figure out other ways of reorganizing our institutions and processes 
that address heat without adding additional uh, resource burdens on a lot of communities. And one, one example as a planner that I'll point to is we approve new development every single day, right? Um, the shape of our future cities is being decided in every rezoning, every plan, um, every new development that gets approved, right? Each of those can either increase the urban heat effect or decrease it. And so we need to just consider heat as a, as a climate risk like we do with flood and wildfire and just integrate it into our daily decision-making processes. Similarly, we have millions of dollars already going out for Department of Transportation infrastructure projects, um, even without Build Back Better, right? Each of those should be considering the heat uh, equity kind of components of it. So is are those new roadways uh, decreasing heat or increasing heat? Are those new transportation systems equitable and available to all modes of transportation? Or, you know, does it force people into automobiles that, um, you know, exacerbate climate change and to increase the urban heat island effect too? So, so I think there's a lot of existing things that we need to also look at and not just kind of pin all of our hopes on silver bullets for public investment. Um, and our surveys have found that a lot of communities are kind of gravitating towards thinking that urban forestry and cool roofs and cooling centers are kind of like the three things that'll save our cities from heat. And those are three important components, but we have to we have to think holistically about everything that cities are actually doing and not just look for a silver bullet to solve all of our problems. Great points all. I don't want to be a hog here, so I'm going to turn it back over to Dan to see if he has any questions to add. Um, yeah, I, I have a, I actually have an audience question too. Um, but you know, to Lad's point, it sounds like we need some metrics too to help guide, you know, um, repurposing some of those existing programs for, you know, addressing these heat um, heat effects. Um, I'm going to uh, interject, interject an audience question here because I think it's a useful follow up to some points that Juan and Sonal have been making. About the weatherization and lie uh, weatherization assistance program in Lahi. Um, Juan and Sonal, I'm happy to hear uh, your your opinions on this. And Lad, please feel free to jump into. And same with you, Kirk. But could you give some examples of how the weatherization program or Lahi specifically help mitigate heat effects? I think someone in our audience may be thinking of them as uh, maybe programs that are maybe when you think of weatherization, you think of cold weather, um, and certainly Lahi. Um, you know, it's heating assistance program. Um, but Juan and Sonal, do you have any suggest or do you have any comments about how specifically states are putting weatherization and light heat dollars into use to help mitigate extreme heat? I, I'd like to hear from Sonal because I know she has worked on that locally in New York City. Yeah, I mean, for for light heat. Um, the cooling assistance portion of the program is only about four percent of the budget for New York State. And I think you can go much, much higher than that. Maybe it's 15 or 20% of the light heat budget can go to cooling for a state and states get to kind of determine that formula within their states. Um, so for New York, they've determined that 4% of the funding goes to the cooling assistance program. That program specifically pays for um, someone who is income qualified to get an AC, um, but that's only every five years for them. And recently, the improvements that they made was that now there is no um, medical um, documentation required to get an AC because that was frankly ridiculous. Um, and it does also um, uh, now if you are on a receiving any kind of federal housing subsidy or on a kind of voucher, you can also now receive that benefit as well, which was previously not a benefit. So all of our public housing residents previously were not able to be a part of the program um, and that has now changed so there's been a couple improvements but um, still it doesn't really um, get at the main need that people have which is paying for their summer utility costs because summer utility bills tend to be 20 30 percent higher um, and con ed is our utility provider in new york state has decided to propose yet another rate hike um, even though people are in more than, we have a, more than $1.4 billion in utility debt in New York State. Um, and so that is something that I, that is a similar problem across um, the US. And so um, for that program, if you are not in New York State, uh, you, know, you can go, um, you can find where your, how your state allocates the cooling assistance program and A, advocate from HHS and the federal government to be putting more money into the cooling program. Um, but you also have to be advocating, the federal representatives, as I understand it, need to also be advocating for their own state to get pools of funding for the program um, because it is not allocated 
every state doesn't get even funding. Um, and then lastly, working with your governor and your state representatives to create um, a formula for that funding that reflects actual need of people in your state. Um, so those are that's that's sort of how it works out. And for the weatherization assistance program, um, it it um, really is helpful for building owners. If you are an area representing a high number of renters, it doesn't become as helpful. Um, you have the problem of the split incentive where um, it's really building owners that want to see their buildings upgraded that um, uh, apply for that program and you don't really see the benefits um, accrue to the renters themselves. So that program is really good for building owners and we, we want to see it expanded because we need buildings to be improved, but um, it doesn't it doesn't help the, the rental market as much. Thank you. I think, I think that what Sonal is saying is indicative of how slow has, you know, have, have institutions been to recognize extreme heat as a problem, right? Only 4% is dedicated to extreme heat, at least in the, not sure if it's national or if that's in the, in the way that, that the state of New York uh, chooses to do that, which is, which speaks to me that th there, there is, there's a tension and there should be a better balance between localities being able to implement their solutions and have discretion, but also there should be national level protections um, to avoid this hodgepodge of implementations of programs like, like of programs like, like the Weather Station Assistance Program that is leaving a lot of people in, in, in the lurch, basically. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. Um, I also wanted to ask a question. Um, so you were um, said something to the effect of long-term fixes are what we need. Uh, we can't treat this, uh, you know, emergency funding has a role to play, emergency you know, response has a role to play, but these are long-term fixes that require, you know, sort of a long-term vision for transformation. But it, but key policy and action, or at least the current state of it, as I sort of been learning about it, seems to separate preparedness and emergency response from sort of those longer-term transformation issues. I'm curious, um, so maybe where that comes from, what the root of that is, or what the cause of that is, and you know how could we better align emergency preparedness and emergency response and those long-term fixes so that we're making progress on both fronts, you know, at the same time. And so, since I sort of stole your words, uh, maybe I'll ask you to go first, and then we'll perhaps hear from Lad and from uh, Warren. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think I'm, uh, I'll caveat with I'm extra cynical today. <laughs> um, so I do feel like it does come a lot down to political will in terms of where a lot of this funding goes and what gets mobilized in places. And um, that doesn't always reflect actual public health need. In fact, it often does not. Um, so that's the overarching answer, in my own opinion. I do think you need both. I think the long what's difficult about long term is that it requires a lot more investment for a lot more people and um, it's harder to achieve. And I think that that's not always the direction that legislators go in. Um, but I do think that's what we need in terms of climate mitigation, like not just for extreme heat, but for discussions around climate change overall. We need to be moving off of fossil fuels. We need to be reducing emissions. And if we're working on that, we are in part addressing a huge problem when it comes to extreme heat. So, you know, weatherizing homes, making homes energy efficient, um, putting cooling infrastructure in schools, for example, all of that, that's considered these long term ideas. And, you know, building tree canopy is very long term. It takes a long time for trees to grow. Um, you know, all of that is long term sol solutions that, that have. Um, really high impact, they just take time and more money. Um, in terms of the emergency response, it's so, so, so critical because we have people dying every single day from extreme heat. We need to be protecting people immediately as much as we are working on how do we um, address the climate crisis. And so that is where we advocate for air conditioning distribution and we advocate for um, better communications around heat safety and warning systems. Um, that is something that also is more achievable on hyper-local level. 
which I think is also a difference in terms of capability. Um, neighborhoods can work on these things. Cities can work on these things. Sometimes it's not stuff. Uh, the long term sometimes are things that um, needs state and federal mobilization to do. So I think that's also a part of why you see kind of a difference in in um, how the short term planning moves and, and the long term moves. Yeah, I would just add that um, a scientist named Luke Howard um, in uh, London actually discovered the urban heat island effect back in 1833. So this is nothing new. We've known about this for over 200 years almost, right? Um, so I mean, despite that fact, like I mentioned before, um, we just don't have the governance structures in place like we do for floods, droughts, wildfires, sea level rise even. Um, and so that's, that's really the stem of why all of our disciplines and departments at all levels of government have kind of historically been um, maybe addressing heat just a little bit, but kind of in their own silos. It's really only been the last decade, I, I would say, like, honestly, the last decade that um, certain areas that have been experiencing more of that heat um, have started to bridge some of those gaps and say, like, we can't address heat in our silos. We have to start to bridge and make those connection points. So again, one way for local communities to make those connection points is to perhaps hire a chief heat officer or create a new office for it. Like I mentioned, that's not possible in most communities in the United States due to lack of resources. Um, so there's other options. We have um, some communities coming together and creating task forces for heat where the public health person and the planner and the hazard mitigation planner and the emergency manager meet with the National Weather Service office and kind of talk about what they're doing with the resources that they have and how are they thinking about heat and what the problems actually are. Um, so I think it's going to look very diverse across the country, um, but it will require new structures and kind of new processes. And it will take a while to figure out what's kind of appropriate at which level of government. Um, and again, it'll require the federal government and state governments to really support those efforts going forward so that the smaller communities aren't left behind. The, the last thing I'll say is um, the federal government just released a report um, a, a while back in April that showed that the proportion of rural community members that are hospitalized for heat illness is actually much higher than the proportion of urban residents that are hospitalized or treated for heat illness. So of course, more of our nation lives in cities, so that number is greater overall, but we're having higher rates of heat illness in rural areas. And I just want to point that out because we think of heat as a, as a city problem, and it's truly not. Heat um, affects cities inequitably, like we've been discussing, but it's a, it's a problem for everyone in the entire country. And, and and I think the engagement that that um, that LAD is proposing absolutely also needs you know at the local level needs the engagement needs the involvement of communities right pre disaster during disaster post disaster um, that is a, that is something that is not given enough attention and especially um, the inclusion of community members in a in a in a in a, in a real uh, honest way um, where uh, whereby we need to broaden the definition of, of what an expert is. It's not just people with uh, masters and PhDs in policy and science. And um, it's also communities who know and understand their own uh, environmental social problems because they have lived they have lived through them and they continue to live through them and they have plenty of solutions. Um, and so I, I, I think that is a sine qua non of, of doing of, of, of creating a resilient equity. It cannot exist without it. Sorry, Juan, that's a, a fantastic point. And I, I, I maybe make a quick observation here. I'd love everyone's thoughts on this. And that is, you know, this issue is increasingly important and it touches so many different or, uh, different populations and organizations and, and, and different, you know, uh, disciplines and so on. And, and maybe because of that, uh, uh, we just don't really speak with one voice uh, or even a unified or a coordinated voice on heat, whereas even other aspects of the climate challenge are able to do that. And mobilize uh, in in, the, in state houses and in, in Congress and in elsewhere to, to to actually make the sort of scale change we need. Uh, so first, I don't know if you agree with that, but I'd be really curious on you know how we can do a better job as a community of people focused on this issue, both because we have to because it affects our lives or because it's our chosen professions. How do we do a better job of mobilizing this community of folks to start to make the change we we're all talking about that we need? 
Yeah, I'll offer off. I'll, I'll offer up um, an example uh, that might be a template for appropriate for some places. And then I think Sonal has some great examples of how you mobilize local communities, which one was just mentioning is so critical too. As far as kind of the expert uh, decision maker um, level here in Arizona, in April we just held our sixth annual Arizona Extreme Heat Workshop which is hosted by um, the National Weather Service Office, hosted by the Arizona Department of Health Services and um, University of Arizona and Arizona State University, and is a meeting place once a year for all of us to come and discuss uh, extreme heat related issues and is one of those connection points I was talking about where those traditionally siloed um, disciplines are coming together. So, you know, we have different topics that we discuss every year. This year we focused on people experiencing homelessness and heat, um, but in the past we've talked about um, emergency management uh, responses, things like that. And so, so I think just bridging those divides and creating those connection points, whether it's a heat workshop like that or you know, a local workshop or a local task force is really important. And, and I think like Juan said, um, you know, that's at the decision maker level. So we had, you know, mostly it was open to the public, but mostly, um, you know, folks that are uh, employed at local governments or the state governments or academics. And we had some elected officials and the media was there too. Um, but I think we need to also do a better job of engaging the public on heat. And I would say again, not just engaging them, we actually need to listen to them and make sure that they can uh, have access to voting and that they can participate in their democracy um, at the same level that everyone else is, because that's where we're going to see real change. I, I agree. I mean, I think we have to realize that uh, there's communities in the Southwest that I've worked with. And when I started working with them in extreme in issues related to urban heat islands and extreme heat, they did not recognize for a number of different reasons. They did, I'm sorry, not that they, they didn't recognize. They didn't prioritize extreme heat in the way that they do now. And it could be because um, it hadn't turned so uh, into such a big problem back then compared to other issues. Remember that communities are facing, especially low-income communities of color, are facing multiple simultaneous hazards at the same time. They're dealing with many, many different things. And in their own quality of life plan, they were more concerned about graffiti and crime and so on. Actually had asked the police to remove trees in the 80s because there were drug deals being done behind behind tree cover and so on, or other sorts of, 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 of activities. Um, so, so recognizing that uh, communities are increasingly seeing these impacts is, 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 is critical to be able to engage uh, with communities and bring them to the table. I mean, I have to, sh to give a shout out to other to organizations. Of course, we act in New York City and in other places. Nature Conservancy, for example, has been in, doing a lot of work in this space in Arizona. Um, the city of Phoenix has partnered with American Forests to, uh, to develop some of these uh, vulnerability criteria for tree canopies. Um, so, so there's a large body of different uh, experts advocates, uh, policymakers that are recognizing this is a problem and that are looking and developing solutions. Um, yeah, no, I agree with everything Lad and Juan have said. And um, I, think, I think it is critical to engage the public in extreme heat uh, for, I guess, like two reasons that have sort of already been said, but one is um, because engaging people means they're engaging in their um, um, their own agency and capacity to fight for any kinds of issues that they want to fight for. You learn how to work on one, you learn how to work on many. Um, and uh, that also means that um, they become uh, advocates of the solutions that they want to see in their community as experts of their community. And that's something that we've had happen in Harlem when we ask people in Harlem what the issues are with extreme heat, to Lad's point, it's very different than what people might say in Arizona um, or a specific part of Arizona um, versus, uh, you know, so that that is really important. And then secondly, the more you engage in an issue and solutioning it, the more you know about it and more you're able to actually just know how to protect yourself and be aware. So engaging communities is not just about um, bringing them into the advocacy space and solutioning but also it does just generally increase understanding and awareness of how to react to um, an extreme heat event that's really helpful um and this has been alluded to a couple times and uh, but i wonder just in a quick reflection from each of you just on ending on perhaps a, a hopeful note 
uh, if there are some examples from communities or, or groups that you're working with uh, of really innovative ways to uh, to actually address heat resilience and, and heat mitigation that you'd like to highlight. One I throw out there just is, for example, under one roof in San Antonio and some of the work they've done to extend weatherization to improve uh, the whole roof system and in income qualified buildings to actually deliver uh, substantial energy uh, benefits in homes that have air conditioning and substantial thermal comfort in homes that don't or, or can't run their air conditioners. And uh, the University of Texas at San Antonio has some great research on that program over the course of a couple of years. Uh, so I, I would point that one out, but I'd be curious others, uh, any ones you'd like to point out? Well, I'd say that some of uh, the some of uh, the engagements I've been doing in Southwest and in Phoenix um, have involved um, communities in um, the climate action in the context of the climate action plan that the city is carrying out. That has a strong heat component, as as, as Lad said, um, with the heat equity office and officer and so on. Um, public stakeholder process around that um, that has a strong um, science component with actual heat health scientists at the helm of that of that uh, our friend and colleague Dr. Dave Ondula. Um, also, um, that sort of um, uh, it, it, like um, like like that said earlier in his presentation, some of these efforts have been uh, spearheaded in the context of climate action plans, but there are other contexts. For example. A, um, in the specific case of the community I, I work with in Phoenix that um, has included heat of safety and mitigation, urban heat and mitigation within their quality of life plan, which includes transit development, economic opportunities, um, economic development within the community, which is a historically low-income community of color. Um, so, um, so engaging in those spaces where communities are seeing holistically that extreme heat protections, resilience, urban heat island mitigation are, are, a, are a broader, are, are, are a component of a broader quality of life planning, human health and well-being. Um, I, I think that's a key place where us as scientists, policy advocates, um, and, uh, and climate change advocates can insert ourselves and bring in our, our skills, our knowledge um, to in service of those communities. Yeah, so for the planning for urban heat resilience book I presented on earlier, um, we looked all across the country kind of on top of the research we've done to find some of those good diverse examples. Um, I'd say there, a question I get asked a lot by journalists is what city is doing a perfect job at heat? And the honest answer is um, it's a very fragmented landscape and there's no one in the entire world that's really addressing heat perfectly or even holistically yet, um, but we are getting so much closer. And so that's my kind of optimistic take is We've seen new chief heat officers appointed. We've seen uh, more cities uh, dedicate resources and kind of attention to heat. So in the last couple of years, it's been increasing. Certainly after the Pacific Northwest heat wave of last year, the attention to heat uh, skyrocketed even in historically cooler places. Um, you know, a couple of examples of cities that um, have recently been doing interesting things. The city of Boston just released a heat resilient solutions for Boston report, which is really holistic. Um, I would urge cities that are interested in kind of looking at a heat plan that covers both heat mitigation and heat management to look at Boston. Um, you know, Baltimore City has uh, has done a code red program for uh, years now, and that's been a really good way to kind of activate uh, services uh, for cooling centers and people experiencing homelessness and check-ins um, with uh, at-risk populations. So Baltimore is interesting to look at for that one. And then of course, Arizona, since we've historically dealt with heat, like Juan was mentioning, you know, we have our annual extreme heat workshop. Um, we have the Arizona Heat Relief Network um, that um, helps with cooling centers. So I think there's a lot of kind of um, good examples of coordination from Arizona as well. So, but no, no perfect example yet, but many exciting examples of innovation that are starting up. Um, I'll just say from New York City, the Department of Health run with, um, in conjunction with um, the mayor's offices and Department of Aging, they run um, New York City's Be A Buddy program, um, which I think is nice to point out. It is a program that essentially organizes neighborhoods to create a communication system with each other to check on each other on a heat wave day, or now it can really be, they've set it up, it could be any moment they need to check on each other. Um, and so that's something that's been piloted 
in, and it's led by community-based groups in a couple neighborhoods in New York City. And it's found to be quite successful and is something that the city hopefully will be expanding into other neighborhoods um, with leadership from, from community-based organizations. And it's um, a great way to just make sure that people are safe in, in that sort of emergency response vein on a heat, extreme heat day. Well, it's a fantastic program and engaging the you know trusted sources to provide uh, you know services to people. It's a, it's a great one. I'd love to see replicated. Well, if, I want to throw it to Dan to take us home, but I want to just add a personal thanks to each of you for your work and for sharing your insights with us today. I really appreciate it. And uh, over to you, Dan. Thanks, Kurt. And thanks to you for helping us uh, navigate a really interesting discussion uh, with our three excellent panelists today. I'm pretty sure Kurt will ask you back. Um, you've, you've acquitted yourself pretty well as a co-moderator at an ESI event, so you're joining the ranks of Rosina Bierbaum and Raya Salter and other ES and Dick Ottinger, other ESI board members who've made some recent appearances in our in our briefing. So thanks so much for joining us uh, and for being on our board of directors too. It's a big help. Um, Lad, Sonal, and Juan, um, like uh, Kurt said, thank you so much for joining us today really interesting presentations. And if anyone would like to go back and revisit the presentations, you can watch the web, web archived webcast, which is available on our website. You can also review all of the um, presentation materials and some of the additional resources um, that our panelists have off um, our audience. So thanks so much for being great panelists. I'd like to say a special thanks to Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman and her staff for making her participation today possible. It means a lot. Uh, to have her um, voice among our panelists today. I'd like to take a moment to say thank you to um, ESI staff who uh, pull these briefings off. That's Dan O'Brien, Omri, Emma, Allison, Anna, and Savannah. And uh, this is the first briefing of um, Molly uh, Brenda Moore, who's our new policy associate. So uh, she's joining us uh, behind the scenes today for her first briefing. And also a special shout out to Jonathan Hers, who's one of our policy fellows for writing the great article, uh, the Q&A article about um, CDC. So thanks, Jonathan, for your contributions today, too. We also have four fabulous summer interns, Christina, Stephanie, Avi, and Nathan. So thanks to all of their help. Uh, my colleague, Dan O'Brien, has just put a slide up. Uh, this is a link to our survey. If folks in our audience have a moment to uh, take our survey, it means a lot. We read every response. If you had any tech issues, audio problems, video problems, if the closed captioning wasn't working properly, or if you have ideas for future briefings, please let us know what you think. It, it, like I said, it really does mean a lot. Um, we are a couple minutes over, sorry for that, but uh, I think it was well worth it. So thanks again to our panelists. Thanks to Kurt. Thanks to Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman. Thanks to everyone who joined us today. I wish everyone a very happy weekend, and we'll see you next Wednesday for Offshore Wind Energy. Thanks so much.